Well, tonight, take your Bibles over to the book of the Proverbs, and we're going to be working out of one uh, verse, Proverbs chapter 11, and uh, verse number 4. Now, this is a uh, chapter of comparison, so um, you could read through the entire chapter. It's going to deal with about four different types of comparisons, but it's going to deal with comparisons. And so in this certain uh, verse, there are two such comparisons. And as soon as you found Proverbs 11 and 4, if you're able to stand, please do so in honor of the reading of the Word of God. The Bible says, Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. Father, would you bless the reading of your Word this evening and grant to your servant that I'd have good sense to preach and you'd fill my mouth with the words, my heart, my mind. And God, I pray that you take control of my body, every piece of me. I surrender it to you as best as I know how. And I pray that the ear of the hearer would be anointed, that what's needed to be heard in every individual will be heard. And Father, that we might work off of what we understand that you've told us. In Jesus' name I pray. And they all said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I was uh, <clears throat> going down through this uh, uh, this text, and uh, it's uh, I've, I've read over it so many times. I don't know about you, but if you'll read a chapter every day out of the book of Proverbs, you'll go through the entire book of Proverbs 12 times in a year. And it's amazing, even after all these years of going back through, uh, how God uh, pulled a verse and put it in my mind. Well, in this certain uh, verse, he talks about the riches uh, that profit not. So uh, what is the main thing today? People are just trying to gather as much as they can gather and hoard it up. Well, there are some things that go wrong in that kind of thought. Well, we're going to look at that. But uh, I want to start tonight just by telling you uh, about this word wrath. I think it's important that we understand uh, what's being said. It's an unusual word, but it's used quite a bit as a stem. It's an outburst of passion, an outburst of passion. Now, listen to what he says. Riches profit not in the day of wrath. Now, uh, there are several words for wrath, but uh, this word wrath is, is able to lead us over to another word, the word orge. It means to uh, overflow, to foam at the mouth. And, and, uh, but the, in this certain word, it's interesting because... Uh, he's dealing with the wrath of God, and it will not profit you to be a, a wealthy person when God's wrath starts. So someone would look at this and say, well, preacher, what's the whole point? Well, the whole point is we're living in an era uh, like these folks uh, were at that time. Uh, Solomon, of course, was king, but he was corrupt in the kingdom. His son would soon take it over. And he would destroy the kingdom in that sense of the word, and it'd be split up, and so it just got worse and worse and worse. But Bob went over to Africa one time, and he was telling me when he got there, he said, I need to exchange uh, my money, my uh, USA currency, uh, for the country's currency. And the guy that was with him, the, uh, the other missionary, said, no, you don't want to do that. He said, why not? And I, I don't remember how, what the currency was he was talking about, but it was like 10 or 12, maybe $20. He said, you'd have to fill up your backpack with the currency, paper currency of this country to cash that in. He said, what do you mean? He said, the money here is worthless. The money here is worthless. Now, when you talk about the eternity of God, that needs to be understood. The money here in heaven is worthless. Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 19, the Bible says, They shall cast their silver in the streets, and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not uh, satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. Now, America has come to a place that it'll rip you off in a New York second. You know what that means. I know you folks do. 
But I mean, they're, they're interested in nothing but your finance. They don't care who you are. You know, I don't know about you, but I get so sick and tired of answering my phone. Now, I answer my phone quite a bit because of the missionaries, and the missionaries never, I just, I just got where I tell the missionaries, if you call me, leave me a message. Why? Well, they still, they've even got my number. A guy called me and said, uh, I said, hello. He said, what you want? I said, I don't know. You call me. <clears throat> he said, no, I didn't call you. You call me. I said, I didn't call you. I'm sitting here. He said, well, they used your number to get me because I used that number to call back. There is, there is no, <laughs> I don't even know a good word to use. There, there's no reason for the attitude of America except she has become a covetous nation. And they'll steal your number. They'll use somebody else's number. They, they, you know, the state says they can't do that. Well, they do it. You call the state and you tell them, I, I, I'm on that list. And they, they all but laugh at you now because it don't matter if you're on a list or not. What they all do is just go ahead and publish everybody's numbers and send a book around you know, about that thick. And we just start looking everybody's numbers up. I mean, you say, well, that's just dumb, preacher. Well, you might as well. What they do is they sell your number so they're making money off of your number. And the company buys your number illegally and call, uses that number to send a message into a home and it has nothing to do with They stole your number. There's still a, a, a thief out there, and they don't care anything about anybody. They're just working on, I need to get one more dollar. And so all of this accumulation, and I, and I know you've heard this before, but it's true. When's the last time that someone died, and they backed a hearse up there and dumped all their bank account off in the hole? Now, I was told when I moved to this community, uh, I won't call any names, but I was told there was a certain funeral home that when the Jews used it, Jews throw money in the coffin, that the uh, guy that was over the funeral home would take the money out, write a check, and throw it back in there. If I'd have been a rich man, I'd have had them bodies exhumed I took them checks out and told them we got to go cash these checks. I'd have fixed his tractor, amen. But he'd take the money and write a check, and you say, well, at least he wasn't stealing. Yes, he was. You know that just as well as I do. Nobody's going to get that check. Nobody's going to cash it. He was safe and sound. Now, that's at a funeral. My wife was telling me just this just, just past week about uh, some crazy things going on at other funerals, and people have sued about it. And uh, they don't know if they got the ashes of their loved one or not. And they come to find out the guy was stealing the organs and then burning the bodies. You don't know if he got your ashes or the ashes out of his fireplace. You just got some ashes. You say, well, can't you test that? You can't test that. There's nothing to test. It's just ashes. And you say, well, preacher, what's the point? That's what the whole point is. God is judging Israel because she had gotten to the place that she'd take a man's pledge, on, you know, use, use his garment, and he and his uh, son would go into the same harlot and have a reunion or a sexual relationship on that garment, which was supposed to be returned to the poor man if he, didn't, if he couldn't pay the bill. And you say, well, that's just, that's just gross. Well, it might be gross, but that's as bad as you can get. In other words, you thumb your nose up at God. Now, listen to me. Anytime you, you, you do things against the poor person just because he or she's poor, you've got God to deal with. He's coming after you on that thing. And so when you read this passage and you're dealing with the, the wrath of God, now let's just understand what the wrath of God is. I'm, I'm preaching this as the final wrath of God. What do you mean? I'm talking about the great day of tribulation, and then after the thousand-year millennium, I'm talking about the wrath of God that cast these alive into hell. And so here we have a picture of saying to them he's, in Ezekiel's day, he said, uh, uh, they cast their silver to the streets, their gold uh, shall be removed. In other words, they don't have anything that they can purchase anything with. They have no valuables that is uh, worth anything. Even their silver and gold is no good. And you say, well, silver and gold is always good, not when you're talking about deliverance from the enemies. There you go. And the enemy here is the enemy 
God. You say, now wait a minute, God's not their enemy. Yes, he is. If they won't serve him, they become the enemy of God. And uh, they can't purchase their way out of that. There's nothing they can do. In Zephaniah uh, chapter 1, verse 18, he said, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be de uh, devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Now there's that word in there that just always strikes me. Every time I see that word, Brother Mike, jealousy, I think about Oprah Winfrey. She's the one that said when her pastor got up when she lived up in Kosciuszko and preached and said that God is a jealous God, she got angry and wouldn't go back to church. In fact, she quit and gave up the, what they, she called the faith because she couldn't stand a jealous God. Now, why would she make such a statement? Well, it's quite easy. They don't want a jealous husband in uh, Hollywood. Y'all listening? They want to be able to go and uh, commit harlotry any time they want, every time they want, any way they want. They don't want nobody coming after them jealous. And when she heard that God was a jealous God, she dumped him. She didn't want God anymore. Well, this is what God says. He says the land where the jealousy of God's not going to be a, 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 not going to be exercised properly, His jealousy shall scorch the earth. H has any of y'all been watching uh, uh, the Mormon city? You know, Salt Lake. Well, go over to it and see how much water is missing out of the Salt Lake. Ever, it's never been that low ever in a day. And it's going down and down and down. Look at California. It's scorched. I mean, it's so bad that the fires come out and they burn everything down. Well, when they burn everything down, then the rains come and they wash everything down. You've got mudslides. I mean, listen, everywhere you go, there is a, a drastic change in the climate. And it's not climate control. It's God control. Now, God's controlling this. You can blame it on anything you want to, but... There is no mother nature, but there is a father, God. And mother nature hasn't got anything to do with what's going on in our world today. And so the rich man, and this is what's interesting, that the rich man, uh, such as Pelosi, she's a rich man. And you say, well, what you got to say? Well, she helped push a package through $1.8 uh, $1 trillion dollars which the most part of that goes to climate control. So we probably gave a trillion dollars to climate control. And you say, well, what's your point? My point is, you see, the rich man thinks he can, he can deliver himself out of anything. And here the rich is, he's thinking, well, if I can fix the climate, we can, get, we can have water when you need water, and ice when you need ice, and summer and winter. Well, listen, you're going to have summer, winter, and, and fall and spring as long as the earth stands. You say, that's not true. Well, it's true according to uh, Genesis chapter 8. So I'm going to stick with the Word of God and, and tell you it's true. And so here what we have is we have a problem with a guy, and his problem is he thinks he can purchase his way out of things. I, again, I won't call a name, but I, I remember a guy telling me one time, he said, he thinks he's got some money I could buy him ten times over. And I didn't say nothing. I just kept quiet. He kept pushing and pedaling that bicycle, so finally I said, well, you might think you could, but I doubt he'd sell himself to you. And you see, that's what a lot of people think. They think I can just be bought. That's what they'll say. I'll just buy him. I'll just buy her. Listen, if you ever come to that place, you're in a whole lot of world of hurt. You don't need to be purchased. You already have been. His name is Jesus. Matthew chapter 16 and verses 24 through 26. Uh, there are those that's uh, constantly seeking riches and They'll obtain it in, by any degree they possibly can. That's just the way this world is working. And Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now listen. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world 
and lose his own soul. Now listen to this last question. Or what shall a man give in exchange of his soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The apostle Paul was under great conviction when he got saved. You know what his conviction was? When he realized it wasn't that he was a murderer, a thief, a liar, a cheat, none of those. He realized he was a covetous person. When God convicted him of covetousness, the Apostle Paul came under great conviction and was able to get saved. You see, covetousness is the farthest from God you can get in the Ten Commandments. Right. When you look at the Ten Commandments, the first thing in the highest law is love God above all gods and have no other gods before Him. And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, you've got to love Him above yourself. You're a God. You've got to love Him above your children. They're, they're gods. Your husband, your wife. I mean, you say we put people in that place, and when God tells us to do something, we say, no, we're worshiping somebody else, whether it's ourselves or somebody in our family or some situation that we've run into. And so whenever you see that, then you start thinking about, well, how does man work? Well, in Luke, a man comes to Jesus, chapter 12, verse 13 through 21, and one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made, me a, uh, who, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Now listen to what Jesus says. And he said unto, unto them, now he's not talking to just that man, but to everybody. <clears throat> he said, Take heed and beware of covetousness. Now, look, look, this comes out of, a, out of a, a true, probably a true situation. I don't doubt that it is. A man's father has passed away. These boys' daddy passed away. and He's left his inheritance, and maybe this is the eldest boy. We don't know anything beyond what we read in this text, but as there's something that has gone wrong because he comes to Jesus and says to Jesus, he said, go talk to my brother that I might get my inheritance. It may be he held back his inheritance. Maybe he didn't give him anything that had, he had coming to him. We don't know the story, but what Jesus said is you better beware of covetousness. If you inherit the whole world, friend, listen to me, and, and you don't get saved, all you got is the whole world that's going to get burned up. And that whole world's not going to do you any good. And so here's what he says. He said, beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and uh, build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine cake, or ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Oh, now wait a minute. Now, I know some of y'all are out there. I look at you, you're looking at me. I'm not a rich man. Up against what? You see, you may not think of yourself as rich, but there's some folks crossing that border all the time, flooding this United States. You know why they're coming? Because what they can live on back there, they can make here and go home and live like a king, so it's relevant. Some of us, according to their standards, we're rich. And so you say, well, I'm not rich. Well, you can keep saying that, but... Uh, I'm telling you, uh, we probably live a lot better than most folks in all sorts of this world. Now watch what he goes on and says. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thou shalt, uh, thou, thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, when you look at this text, it needs to be understood that Jesus is talking about what this man's done. Now, it's not, he's not arguing the case that it's not good to store up, it's not good to save. That's not what he's saying. 
But what he's trying to bring out is, just think about that little lady down the street, her husband's dad, her children are all dead and gone, and she's outside picking up rice where she can or picking up whatever fruit she can find on the bushes. And, and here this man is with all these goods, and all he had to do was just sneak off down there or send one of his servants and say, listen, here's you a whole bunch of groceries, uh, enjoy them. No, he doesn't try to help anybody. He's too uh, self-centered. He's just looking to set up a, a good a time to retire and do nothing. I've never wanted to retire. I, I do not want to retire. Now, I may get where I can't go, and then I'll have to retire, but I do not want to retire. You say, why? What are you going to do? I'm a preacher. I mean, I retire. What do I do? Well, I go to the farm. I'm not a farmer. I'm a preacher. I'm going to be preaching somewhere. If I had to go to the street and preach on the street, I'm just telling you, I don't want to retire. Why? Well, I love what I do. Why in the world would you leave something that you just love doing to go do something you ain't been called to do? Some of these folks have said to me, you know, you know, you're getting up on that 65. It's coming up on you now. You're going to have to retire. I'm not retiring. I'm just going on record right now and telling you I'm not retiring. I don't want to retire. I want to aggravate this church as long as I possibly can. Amen? And you say, well, preacher, what are you, what are you going to do? I'm going to trust God and just keep on marching. Now, look. He's talking about the rich man, and the rich man is self-centered. I'm not going to be self-centered. I want to do something in the church. I want to continue to, uh, to be a part uh, of the work of the church. Here's a man that's his concern is maybe somebody will steal some of my goods if I pile them up on the side of the road. You could be like the little boy that he went by and stole a watermelon out of a, out of a man's yard, and so the man drove up a sign in his yard, and it said, you know, in that little stack of watermelons he had, he said, one of these watermelons is poisoned. And so the little boy got him a sign, went out there and drove up in the field, and he said, one of these in this field is poisoned too. Now, what did that man gain? He didn't gain anything. I mean, what he should have done was took the loss of one watermelon, and but he was, his greed was so much with an entire field and uh, that entire field of watermelons was uh, unharvested for the most part. And so he lost the whole field. He couldn't sell it to nobody. Nobody would buy them melons. Why? He's got a sign drove up out there. Now, one of these watermelons is poison. Well, you say, that's just wickedness. Well, both of them was involved in the same practice. Amen? Now, here's the part I wanted to get to. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. You know the setting. This is the church, uh, the modern-day church that we have today. It's, uh, uh, it's coined that, that very way. So when you look at the church of the Laodiceans, you're looking at a church that thinks it has it all. Now watch what he says. He says to the church, he says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now, in a book I read years ago, I, I've since then probably given it away, but I remember reading that book. They had a, it was a customs and something, that uh, Ershman, I think, is who put it out. I think I've got it on CD. But anyway, I was reading, and one of the things that was said about that certain uh, city, Laodicea, is a great earthquake hit them, and they refused the federal money that came from, from Rome uh, to fix their, their country. They were so wealthy, they all paid for it themselves. What it boiled down to, they were just arrogant. Right, and they said, we'll fix it ourselves. We don't need you. Well, they did need them, and that was on a certain trade route, uh, but they nevertheless, they fixed it. Well, Jesus says to them, he said, he said you think you are rich. And they did. They thought they was rich. Well, I'm, you know, I, I'm... Trump has got somewhere eight, nine billion dollars. You know that kind of money don't even register in my mind. I don't know how to think about that. I don't have nine billion. I don't have a billion. I don't. I don't have any money to amount to any amount. I mean, someone says, "Well, uh, you got a hundred thousand dollars?" No, I don't. Well, that rent that, didn't it? Amen. Well, you say, "Well, what do you mean, preacher?" Well, uh, to the church, they thought they were wealthy. Why? Because everything was just so smooth, everything going along good. Nobody is mad with nobody. Everybody's getting along real well, and the world likes them, and they like the world, so it's just paying off for them. 
So watch what he says. He said, you say you're rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You see, the problem is your finances don't cover up your sin. In fact, a lot of times your finances will show where your sin is. Y'all remember the time that someone would steal money from a store or a bank or something, and they get arrested. Y'all remember them days? Yeah. Isn't it amazing that we've come so far that they arrest these guys, they go into the cell, and the next morning they're out on the street, and depending on what denominational race you're going to be in, Democrat, Republican, Independent, you know, if you're in the wrong crowd, you're going to be tried. If you're not in the wrong crowd, you're going to be released. Well, that got quiet. Amen. I mean, let's just get honest about it, folks. I ain't trying to be racist about this thing. I, I don't care what color you are. If you've done it wrong, you're wrong. If sin is sin. Don't, it don't look at your color. It looks at your heart. And then you come to this old world like we got going on right now, and, and so one side gets uh, chastised, and I mean, they pay the penalty. And, we, and you and I, we get so mad. I know you do. You get like me. I can't believe they're just going to turn him loose. That's the eighth person he's killed. Turn him loose. Well, what about the old boy that killed that gal up in California? I mean, he just got out of jail that day and come out there and killed her. And they've already sent him back, I forget how many times, several times. In fact, they was going to go find him and send him back again. Well, they had him in the jail cell. They didn't have to go find him. He was right there. Now, would you all agree with me that's horrible? Well, let me tell you one worse. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed God. How have you robbed God? In your tithes. Your offerings. Wow. You mean I'm on the same ground as that rich man trying to pay his way out of wrath? You absolutely are. A thief is a thief is a thief is a thief. You say, well, uh, now are you calling me a thief? I didn't call you a thief. The Bible said, will a man rob God? If, if you feel like you robbed God, don't look up here and get mad at me. You can come tell me after a while, I apologize, Pastor, I was mad. Because uh, the truth of the matter is, God said, will a man rob God? Yeah. Amos asked him, said, will you rob God? They said, we wouldn't rob God. He said, yeah, you have robbed God. And he told them where they robbed him. And boy, it upset the whole crew. Well, that's where we are. We're in America, and uh, we, we think we got it made. But notice what it said, riches profit not in the day of, his, of wrath. And so you think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm living up a good life. I've got all the things I need. I mean, everything's going good with me. And uh, the thing you hadn't done, you hadn't given God his due. Now listen to me. I'm going to get real, real simple here. When you give a tithe, that's one-tenth of your income, before taxes. Before taxes, you cut your tithe. If nobody gets paid but God, you pay God. Pretty sure I disagree with you. That's why you're where you are. You won't know why you're broke. You won't know why your refrigerator blew up, your car flats, and I mean, everything is burping and going the wrong direction. You won't know why that is because God has not rebuked uh, the eater. He's just constantly chewing up everything you got. And he's not going to rebuke it until you do what's right. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with being rich. One of Jesus' favorite buddies was rich. Remember Lazarus? He wasn't no poor man. He was a rich man. He took care of Jesus every time Jesus came to town. But he's a saved man. You say, well, what about Job? He was the wealthiest man in the world at the time and righteous. Well, what, how in the world that happened? God blessed him. Why did he bless him? He honored God with his life. Abraham, come out of early Chaldee, bringing all of his wealth with him, 
not just the livestock, but also his uh, slaves and uh, also uh, his finances. He come out of there a wealthy man and was even more wealthy in the close of his days. And so when we read this and you say, well, what, what are we talking about, preacher? Well, he, he says, you don't know this. He said, but the truth is, and this is the truth. He said, you are poor. If you're not rich toward God, you're poor. Amen. You're poor. You're miserable. You're wretched. You're blind. You know, you see this Hollywood bunch, and they, they have the best of everything, and they go shoot themselves or hang themselves or take too many certain aspirins or whatever it is. They kill themselves with all this wealth. Now, I'm a little on the slow side, so y'all just help me here. But if I had that much money, I don't think I'd be that unhappy. Now, if I had that much money and didn't love God and use it for God's glory, I'd be an unhappy person. I'd be miserable, wretched, and blind, poor, and naked. And that's what he's trying to get across to us. You see, what you do with your riches uh, determines who you really are. It tests your character. It's funny how God uses that all through the Bible. He tests the character of his people by what they do with their wealth. Listen, God doesn't want you to be poor. That's not what he's saying. But he wants us to be rich toward him. In Luke chapter 12, again, verse 18, he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns, build greater barns. And then he goes on and says, And I'll say to my soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. He's not no more concerned about what God wants him to do in life as anything else. He is the nominal Jew. That's the way the Jew operates. And by the way, I know some Gentiles that's followed that suit quite well. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said in verses 28 through 33, He said, Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which is today, or which is, or which today is, and uh, tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or, What shall we drink? Or, Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have needed all of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, what's he trying to tell us? Uh, listen. I've got, when I buy shoes, I usually buy boots. And I'm wearing loafers. I, get, I don't know what you call them. They're just shoes, dress shoes. But i got some shoes that's probably older than some of these people in this room. And, uh, in fact, I had a pair of boots I had bought. They were Nakonas. I had bought them, I don't know how many years ago. A guy saw them. He said, boy, I like them boots, preacher. I just kept them polished. I said, you need them? He said, I sure do. And I handed him them boots. He wore them boots. It didn't take him long to wear them out. He didn't polish them. He didn't take care of them. But I had them boots probably 20, 22 years. And I got some boots in there just like that right now. And, and I don't throw suits away. I give them away to people. Sometimes they'll come in, and they'll be as my size, and they'll have a little bitty suit on, and they can't even breathe. They're trying to get that thing on. And I say, come on back here, and I'll give you a suit. And I've, I've got them in all sizes, by the way. If you need a suit, just drop by the house and, Unless it's real little. If it's real little, I never had wore that suit. I'm just telling you straight up. But uh, you say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, God provides for his people. Now, a lot of people don't like this, but you know what? God provides by his people through his people. Now, he doesn't have to do that. I mean, he could make it where you made enough money to do that. Or, but most of the time, I find out that when God does something with somebody or for somebody, he does it through a channel of blessing in one of his own people. You know, I've said this before. I'll say it to you again. I've, I, oftentimes, I've had people come to me and say, so-and-so is in need of some finances. You think the church can help them? I said, why did God let you come into that and not me what do you mean preacher God didn't tell you to come tell the church God told you there's a person in need why aren't you meeting that need you want it met but you want the church to do it well preacher that's what the church is supposed to do 
Are you not the church? Are you not? The whole body that's in this room is the church. It's not the, the building and the finances that, that we're supposed to. Listen, when God puts that in your, in your lap, you take care of it. You say, well, I didn't have enough money. Then ask for some help. But don't ask for some help and not, and not do what you can do. I've had so many people that do that. And listen, I, so, now there's some of y'all sitting here, and y'all know better than this now because I've, I've helped you. And I never, I never said, now I want my money back. I've never said that. If I have some of y'all that I've helped stand up right now and straighten me out. Why? Because Jesus says, hope that they don't give it back. What's he trying to teach? He's trying to teach us that covetousness is a bad, bad piece of sin. And it'll, just, it'll start on you real small. It'll grow real fast, real big. Now, my wife would get mad at me oftentimes. She'd say to me, I gave you $100 at the first of the, of the month. What happened to that money? And I'd try to start trying to tell her what happened to it. And she says, I'm not giving you any more. She gave me the checkbook one time. That really didn't work. <laughs> That was a bad, bad decision. And, uh, I mean, people get in the bind, and I'd say, well, I, I'd look at my amount, and i said, we still got enough to help you, and I'd cut a check. Oh, I'd get in some bad trouble. I'd come home, and she said, now, what are we going to do to buy groceries? I said, we got groceries. And, you know, I don't understand women. I'm just going to tell you straight up, I've tried. And I've just about give up. I, Solomon couldn't get it, and if he couldn't figure it out, I know I ain't going to figure it out. But I'm looking at a freezer that's completely full, and uh, we don't have any groceries. Y'all come up with an answer on that sometime. Let me know, and uh, I'll try to explain that to my family. Let me hit three things real quick, and we're going to close. Maybe four. When he says to us, Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death, he talks about it can the money that you make cannot buy friends. Now notice in Revelation chapter number six, fifteen through seventeen, he said the kings of the earth and the great men, and the rich men, the chief captains and the mighty men. Uh, now notice how he starts off with the upper echelon. He's dealing with the wealthy, the strong, the powerful people. He says the the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains and the mighty men. And every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So here is the rich man, and he is in the day of tribulation. And uh, he has, uh, by the way, I... I I, I, I marvel at what, what rich people do. They have, they have bought mountains, rich people have, and they bored holes deep, deep down in those mountains, and they, that's where they're going to live whenever, the, whenever everything gets bad. Well, there's a problem with that. You see, there's going to be a great earthquake one day. Are you all listening? And that earthquake, it says, every mountain shall be brought low. So listen, they just, what they're doing, they don't even know this, and I've tried to tell some, but you're just building you an expensive coffin. That's just a grave slot. You say, what do you mean? Well, when the mountains are brought low, what do you think that means? That earthquake's going to tumble every mountain. Every, every mountain's going to be level with the ground. Now, what he says to us when you, when you look at this, he's talking about the great men, the rich men, the, the, uh, I mean all these kings and such as that. And, and they're on the top, then you get down to the bottom and the free man and the slave and so on and so forth. Well, you can't buy any friendship. You say, why? Because they're all doing, going through the same thing you're going through. During the Great Tribulation, there's not going to be nobody buying a friend. They may start off buying some friends, but it ain't going to last long. And you, see, you say, well, what's that mean? Well, you can't buy friends. They, they're going to be in the same mess you're in. And then he goes on in Proverbs 19 and 6. He said, Many will entreat the favor of the prince, and every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. So uh, poor folks, they like to get around rich folks. Why? Because rich folk give them stuff. 
in a church that we pastored one time. There was a lady that bought name brand stuff. Now, my name brand stuff is uh, it's usually J.C. Penney. That's a pretty good name brand in my day. That's what we do. And, uh, and then I, I'd go to the brother's store and buy some of my suits. Now, when I say brothers, they didn't have a name on the store that I know of, but they sold some pretty, pretty nice suits for a cheap price. Amen. And I'd go there and buy my suits. And uh, I'd, I'd try to stay in a suit. You say, why? These are my work clothes. Now, I don't want to go out there tomorrow morning, get up, and you walk up, see me in my suit, and I'm drenching wet and sweat, taking care of chickens, picking in the garden, and doing some other stuff. That'd just be dumb. Now, when I do that, I put on different clothes. But now, listen to what he says, and this is important. You need to get this. He said, many will entreat the favor of the prince, and every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. And so what he says is we all want the right people to think the right thing about us. Make sense? And then he goes on and says that on top of that, we enjoy when they give us gifts. You know what he's saying? You can be bought. He's telling us to beware of the covetous. You can be bought. Many will entreat the favor of the prince. Why? Because the prince has power with the king. And in this case, the prince is probably the king. And what he's trying to tell us, he said, listen, you don't worry about the kings of this world. You worry about the king of kings that's coming to over, overcome this world. And so when we look at this text, in my estimation, it seems to me that every man can be bought, what he's saying, if the price is right. And I've had some pretty good prices thrown in front of me at times, so I can tell you there is a temptation what he goes on, he says, not only can you not buy friends, you cannot buy favor with God. Now he says, and the rich man, and he talks about what happened. He says, to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that set us on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. You see, you can't buy your favor with God. You say, well, I'll just, I'll just throw out my gold and my silver and I'll just give it all to God. Well, God don't need your gold, nor does he need your silver. You, you and I need to understand something. God created all of that. And I noticed in my Bible that when we get to heaven, what we value so deeply is going to be gravel on the road. We're going to be riding down the streets of gold. Amen? You say, well, what do you mean by that? God doesn't need our gold nor our silver. What God's trying to do is establish that relationship. And what he wants is he wants the first of everything in our life. He is preeminent, he's first place, and he deserves the first of everything. Whenever they had their crops in the old Bible days, the first fruits went to God. Everybody brought the first fruits. Why? It represented what God was going to do with the, with the rest of the fruit. So if you want a good bounty, a good, uh, a good crop, then maybe you ought to try to do it God's way. Yeah. Well, you say, well, preacher, how can I, how can I have favor with God? I'm going to give you a hard word, and it's called obedience. Obedience. You say, what do you mean? I mean, whatever God calls you to do, tells you to do, shows you in the Word of God to do, you do that. Now, the Bible says concerning Samuel, the little prophet boy that would grow up one day and be the great man of God that he was, it says, and, and, and the, child grew, or the child grew on and was in favor both, watch this, with the Lord and also with men. Now, that's an interesting text because he was a little boy at that time. And yet he was growing in favor with God and man. Now, what do you mean? He was an upright fella in every sense of the word. And here's the interesting thing. There was another boy that was born. He's a little lad too. And this is what it said about him. It said, And Jesus increased in wisdom and statue and in favor with God and man. You see, Jesus didn't come to be God. He came to be a man. And so he came through the natural course of a birth. And he's coming up just like everybody else comes up. He's, he's growing up on this planet just like everybody grows up on this planet. You say, you think he ever skinned his knees? I have no doubt. You think he ever got a thorn in his hand? Probably so. You think he got splinters? Yeah, he was a carpenter. I mean, he suffered everything that you and I suffer, but yet without sin. And, and the Bible says he grew in favor with God and with man. Now, why is that? Jesus said, I do always those things which please him. Please who? My Father. 
It's a simple act of obedience that causes us to grow in favor. It cannot be purchased by silver or gold. It's by obedience. I got to hurry. I done got too far along. You cannot buy your freedom from God's everlasting wrath. He says uh, that sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. The great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? When God pours out His wrath on the earth, it don't matter how rich you are. I saw here the other day, I was reading an article. I don't remember the bank. It's one of the oldest world banks. It's financed wars on both sides of the fence for countless years. And it was said that that bank cash value, what they have in the bank is over $12 trillion. Now, I can't get it, you know, I didn't even know what a what a hundred billion looked like until George Bush got into office and said, Well, we're gonna bail out the bank, they need nine hundred billion. Who ever heard of nine hundred billion? If he just said nine hundred million, I said, Man, that's a lot of money. But nine hundred billion, I couldn't even get that to compute in my mind. And now we don't even talk. I mean, we done went past the billions. We was in the millions, and uh, we went past the millions, got in the billions. Now in the billions, that's no more good. Now you got to get in the trillions. Yeah. And so here, here we have people that's trillionaires. I guess that's what you call them, trillionaires, yeah. What are they going to do in the day of God's wrath? They're going to burn just like everybody else. You cannot buy your freedom. You say, well, preacher, what does a man to do? He better trust God. He better trust God. You see, the Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, for as much uh, as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers. Well, if you're not, if you're not uh, saved by that silver and gold, then what are you saved by? By the faith in the blood of the Lamb of God. That is the deliverance of the saints. If you're going to escape the wrath of God, it'll be through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that blood will have to be upon you, and you will have to be a part of the family of God. And James, he got on to him pretty tough. Uh, chapter 5, Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl uh, uh, for your miseries uh, that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Uh, your, uh, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them uh, shall be a witness against you. And uh, shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped up treasures together for the last days. Now I can't prove this. I don't. I don't often share this kind of stuff. But I can't prove it. But here's what I. Here's my take on it. We got congressmen and representatives and speakers, minority and majority. And then none of them, when it gets down to a critical moral vote, that'll hardly vote in a godly manner. There's always got to be a little door open that says, like abortion, we're not going to shut it all the way down, just down to this. And they leave that little door open. And then you ask yourself, why? Have you ever thought about this? Those people in power believe somehow that when the Antichrist comes, which they won't identify him as such, but when the world leader is chosen, if they've done good to get him there, maybe they'll be a part of his cabinet. Let that soak in a little while. You say, preacher, I don't think that's biblical. I do. Why? Look at the kings in Europe. Look what's happening right now. People flood money to what? We, we're taxed to breathe. I said years ago, I said, you watch one day they'll tax us just to breathe. You know, we have a, a, a breathing tax. Y'all don't believe me, do you? It's called climate control. You pay for the air to be purified. Ain't nobody going to do that. 
And the ones that's worse is the ones that complains the most. America is just about, you know, it's hardly got any more problems with that kind of stuff, but yet we're, we're taxed to breathe. <laughs> he said, go you now, rich men, weep and howl your miseries that shall come upon you. He said, they're not here right now. You're laughing and having a good time, and you're mocking the poor. You're ridiculing them. You're using them, and that's what they do. Listen. When you look at, at, at politicians, always remember this. When they're talking to you, they want somehow to get the advantage over you. Now, I, I used to talk to politicians. I would I'd put on like a pair of blue jeans and flannel shirt or something that was casual, put a baseball cap on, and, and uh, I wouldn't shave that morning. I'd just make sure I had a stubble. And I'd go to them rallies, and, and this old boy walked up to me. He said, I'd like to get your vote. I want you to vote for me. I said, what's your platform? And he started telling me, and, and he was looking at my face, trying to read my face, and I just blank, you know. It ain't hard for me to be blank. It's real easy. And I just stared at him, and he said, uh, he said well, and I said, well, well what, about the, what about this gambling? What's your take on that? He said, what's your take? I said, I'm not running for a public office. You are, so what's your take? That's right. And he said, uh, well, he said, uh, I, you know, I, and he said a whole lot. And I said, well, okay, now what's your take on the gambling? He said, I just told you. I said, sir, you didn't tell me nothing. You just went around the sump a bunch of times. You never told me, are you for gambling or are you against gambling? Now, that can't be any easier. Now, are you for it? He said, well, you know, a lot of people's getting on to me because I've been voting against it. He said, I'm thinking about changing my vote. I said, well, you've lost mine. This is what he said. He said, well, mister, let me tell you, he got mad. I mean, he did, he got mad. He said, let me tell you something. He said, do you go in the grocery store and people jump all up and down on your, back, on your wife's back because she is your, uh, your spouse and you voted against the gambling? I said, no, but they come to her and jump on her pretty regular because of what I preach. How about that? And he started weeping. I took him out from that tent, me and John Hugh Gardner, I'll never forget that, and walked out from that tent. He said, he said, Preacher, he looked at me with tears streaming on his face. He said, You know what? It comes time. If you can't stand the heat in the kitchen, you ought to get out and quit cooking. I said, That's exactly right. And he did just that. He quit. He didn't he, he didn't uh, uh, make the run, so I said, Well, you know, at least he had the good sense to do what he should have done. Amen. You cannot, you cannot stay off God's ferocious wrath. It's coming. There's no way you can avoid it. I want to give you three things just real quick. I'm going to do it rapidly, so just write them down. The righteous have the divine favor of God. You say, why is that? Well, 1 Peter 2, 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye shall, or should show forth the praises of him that hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, that's the child of God. And the child of God's righteousness gives him divine friendship in the house of God. Proverbs 18:24, the Bible says, uh, uh, man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Now watch this. And uh, there is a friend that sticketh closer than any brother. When uh, Jesus talked about that friendship, that's that closeness, in John 15, 13 through 17, he talked to his disciples. He told them, I have, I have chosen you. You have not chosen me. And he talks about laying down his life for his friends. He said, and you are my friends. You see, you can't buy a friendship. You say, oh, you can buy it. No, you won't never buy a friend. You'll buy an acquaintance. You'll buy somebody that'll let you down in the spur of the moment. I mean, you do everything for them, and I'll make you a promise. When you can't do anything for them, they're gone. I've seen it happen so many times uh, when people would see that. Well, the righteousness will experience the divine fulfillment of God's promises. Well, what do you say? He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. For where I am, there you shall be also. Now, Jesus Christ has promised us a place. Now, when we get through all of the judgments and all, all of that, and everybody is in their final abode, uh, the lost undone is in hell. They'll never get out. And the saints of God are going to receive the promises of God. God said he, he himself would wipe away every tear from our eyes. 
There'd be no more death, no more separation. There'd be, listen, can you just imagine? And now God says he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. You know who that is? God's going to do that. Now, how's he going to do it? I don't have a clue, but you know how I wipe away somebody's tears? I reach up on their cheek and wipe them off, don't you? Can you just imagine the God of all gods, God Almighty, Gracious and merciful is his name. He wipes the tears off our cheeks. No more tears. No more death. No more separation. No more pain. No more sickness. Yeah. You can't buy that outside the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, that's precious. Listen to me. You may not think of yourself as rich, but listen to me. What you have, you've got because God allowed it. What he asks is 10%. That's it. Every one in this church ought to give 10 cents on a dollar, period. Preacher, now this is a tithe. No, it's not. It's about covetousness. It proves a covetous heart. If you won't give God his due, then you're covetous. And God can get it any way he wants. He bought us with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and soul, which are God's. If God don't rebuke the devourer, some folks never make it. Oh, I thought one time, Sister Gail, I was going to beat God. You know, I was going to keep it quiet and do it. Nobody would know it but me and God. I don't know how many flat tires I had that that year, but I had a flat tire almost every time I turned around. I said, you know, I don't think it's worth it. I was mad with God. God said, oh, that's all right. I've been, people stay mad at me all the time. I'm used to that. He just let me go. He just he just didn't devour the, uh, devour the, the 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 booger kept eating up my tires. Got right with God, and I've seen times there ain't no way that car should have made it to the gas station, but it'd be sucking fume when it rolled in there, and I'd fill it up. Me and Miss Beck went down to, to the. Uh, Hattiesburg, we had to get some stuff. I got on the highway and I found me the perfect speed at 68 miles an hour. If you're on Highway 49, it's slow enough that the state troopers won't mess with you. If you're on interstate uh, uh, at 70 miles an hour, it won't it won't bother you. You're two degrees underneath that, and they won't bother you then, and you'll save a bunch of gas. I'm telling you, saving gas today is probably a pretty good thing. But you know what? I could try all of that. I could get down to driving 45 miles an hour, the minimum speed limit, uh, limit on an interstate, and God could curse it and cause me to burn more gas at 45 than I would if I was driving 75. Inside of this message, there's also the thought. I won't preach any more of it, but there's the thought. That maybe you're not saved. That's why you don't give. You ever think about that? Now, I've seen it both ways, church. And I've been on both sides of that fence. I can tell you, don't get in the covetous side. It's a terrible place to be. I mean, it is. I, I'm, I marvel through the years. I do. I think about the help God's given me through all these years. Uh, I went through that life screening. Y'all ever went through that thing? They wanted to find out if my arteries were opened and all that kind of stuff. They said, man, you got clean arteries. I said, well, I live a clean life. You know what I ate? I ate bacon. I ate pork of all kinds. Just had pork for dinner today. Everything greasy I like. If it's fried, dyed, and laid to the side, I'm on it. It's amazing. 
I mean, I am. People say, you ought not be eating that. I said, you ought not be telling me what to eat. And I eat it. It's bad for you. You're going to die. I mean, just get it in your mind. You're going somewhere soon. You're going to die. If you want to die starving, go ahead. I prefer to eat. I eat one time a day. I start in the morning, quit in the evening. Amen? You say, preacher, no, you don't. No. I'll, uh, I'll eat, a, I'll eat uh, one to three eggs in the morning, a piece of bacon. That's it. Drink my juice. Outdoor I go. Some ter- sometime around from two to four, sometime to five, Beck called me and said, dinner's ready. So we eat that. We're done. That's our meal for the day. And my body has been pretty good so far. Are you saying, well, now saying that, your body's going to go down. It may do it. I may drop dead here in a few minutes. I don't know, but I'm just telling you, God's been watching over me pretty good. And I just consider that an honor. I'm going to keep right on doing what God said do. And you say, why? Well, you can't buy what God will give you. He'll give you life everlasting. And if he'll give you life everlasting, it's at the expense of his dear son. Why in the world is it so hard for us to dig in our pocketbook and give 10 cents on the dollar and maybe an offering? Why is that so difficult? Well, something wrong with the heart is what it is. Heads are bowed, hearts are humble, the one looking about. Father, this, uh, this evening we have... Uh, I've done what I felt like you'd had me to do, and I thank you for walking me through it. I know, Father, we left out a great deal of stuff, but I know also that you've moved on hearts. I've seen it in their faces. And I pray, Father, that we just be a people that just honors you. You told us you'll no longer honor them that, don't honor, that won't honor you. And uh, so, Father, we, we want to be honored by you. And in order for us to do that, we've got to become obedient to what you say and what you uh, push upon us to do. Now, Father, I pray for the church tonight that we do everything that you've called us out to do. Father, I pray that we'd realize that we already had the friendship with, with, with you through Christ Jesus. We had the freedom from the wrath to come because of the blood of Christ who has paid our price. Lord, there's nothing that can, that can sever that relationship. We've got it from now on. I pray we'd honor you in uh, all that we have and all that we do. Now, heads are bowed and hearts are humble. No one's looking about. <coughs> I asked you a simple question. Are you doing what God called you to do? Are you giving an honest tithe and offering? You say, well, no. Then you ought to start. I'm not going to apologize for that because that's where the blessing of God comes from. God never blesses disobedience. He sure won't bless a thief. But what worries me, when you stay in that certain place and don't, don't give, listen to me. You're moving into covetousness. And that's a very bad place to be. If you are a child of God, he's going to correct that. You're not going to get away with it. He's going to correct it because you belong to him. And he's given you a, a command, and he says, do my word, and you're going to have to. And then also, I, can, I concern myself deeply with personalities that argue against the uh, New Testament tithe. Well, listen to me, friend. It was New Testament when Jesus was walking the face of the earth, and it's the same way that they collected the church or collected the money in every church through their tithes and offerings. Dear church, that's the way it has to happen here. There's no other way. Through the years, I have had people come to me and say, Preacher, can we have a bake sale? Can we wash cars, do this and that? And uh, for money, I said, no, you cannot. Why? Because God has laid out how he supports his church through tithes and offerings. And that is sufficient. If we're not going to be obedient to that, no matter what we do, He will not rebuke the devourer for our sakes, and he'll just eat up everything we try to do. So why don't we just do it God's way? Heads are bowed, hearts are humble. You say, Pastor, i got to get the altar. i got to get this off my chest. Well, as we stand to the feet, that's your opportunity. Even now, you come.